Good morning, Advocate Holland Mota. Good morning, Deputy Chief Justice. Good morning to the Commissioners. Are you comfortable? I am now. After a three hour travelling from Pretoria and the traffic, I'm comfortable now. Thank you. Gauteng <sighs> <laughs> traffic. Yeah. What can we do? You hold a BURIS and LLB degrees. That's correct. Which led you to work uh, with the Department of Justice, first as a clerk, then you became a prosecutor, magistrate, you taught at some stage, and in 1998 you joined the Pretoria Bar. That's correct. And that's where you still are to this day? Correct. All right. Uh, you have had numerous judicial acting stints in the Gauteng Division, both in Joburg and Johannesburg and Pretoria? Mostly in Pretoria, but I also one term uh, was acting in Johannesburg, but specifically in the criminal court there. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you've, you've, uh, you've started acting in these courts in 2015 and have repeatedly went back. Correct. And the last didn't run until this past June. Yes, but which is also not on because I acted now two weeks ago in the recess at the request of the Deputy Judge President. I assisted in the past recess as well. All right. Well, I'll, I'll leave it to your JP to flesh out what yes. you did during those, those acting stints. Um, as I recall, you've previously been interviewed for a vacancy in this same division, not so, in 2019, was it? Sorry, can you just repeat? You, you, were, you previously came before this commission for an interview for a vacancy yes. in this division. I have been here uh, on three occasions. Oh, three times? Yes. Mm -hmm. I recall, when was the last one? In 2019? The last time was in April of this year, but for oh, the Limpopo division. I recall. Yes. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm aware of the 2019 one, and my recollection is that you had had a fairly good interview and the only real quibble then was the a paucity of judgments which you have produced despite all these opportunities you've had to act. Yes. Uh, has the number of your written judgments increased since that interview? Yes. Mm -hmm. how, how many written judgments have you produced so far? Um, in total, uh, my reserve judgments from when I started was, uh, it's about 68. Uh, I have no outstanding judgments. Um, there were plus minus 15 to 20 applications for leave to appeal filed, of which only two um, were successful. Um, five were, my judgments were, up, uh, yeah, five, four were upheld in the Supreme Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. So in total, there's only two judgments which was overturned. Yeah. All right. All right. I, I'll, I'll leave it here for, for, for now. Commissioners, do, oh, JP Mlambo, do you have uh, questions for your candidate? Th thank you very much, uh, DCJ. Good morning, John. Good morning, JP. I got it right. It's not Johan, it's John. It's John, yes. <laughs> and and if, if I may say, we're not going to discuss the Gunners and Man United at this stage. No. No, that's off the table. Yeah. Um, you've acted for a total of 14 weeks in the opposed motion court. Correct. And that's a court where you would pick up reserve judgment. Mostly there and also from time to time uh, on the urgent court. In the urgent yes. court. And uh, you've said for, I think it's uh, uh, in the urgent court, you've said for a total of six weeks. Correct. Now, you've acted for a number of longer stints where you would have allocations in the urgent court or post motion appeals. Yes. Am I correct? You're correct. How were you able to handle that? Because all those are heavy duty courts. May, may I say, JP, um, you learn, if I take it from the beginning where I start in 2015 up until now, you learn 
to be m more productive and to manage it better. Yeah. Um, fortunately, your opposed motions is normally a week in advance, which is being allocated to you by the senior judge. And then it's not a nine to five work. Uh, in the afternoons and the evenings, there were evenings where you toll through your opposed motions to prepare uh, late past midnight, midnight just to go to court prepared because uh, it's a firm belief with me you don't go into any court, especially the post motion court, unprepared. So you have to do it after hours. Um, yes. Yeah. And uh, in the, have you had occasion to sit in full court yes. appeals? And did you write those judgments? Yes, I, I've written two of the three judgments in the full courts where I sat. What was the feedback from the presiding judges? Uh, the last one now, um, Judge Kabushi uh, didn't even uh, change a comma in the judgment. She was totally satisfied. Uh, the first one, it was with Judge Potrell, and she made one or two adjustments uh, style-wise, and the others with uh, where Judge Corey van Westhuizen was uh, the senior judge, uh, there were one or two remarks he made, but in general, uh, no serious changes were made. Yeah. And I just want to, you to tell the Commission why you've acted so long, because I've had a chat with the DJP, and uh, am I correct that you've written to both me and him to say, should we run short of judicial capacity like a judge falls sick urgently, mm -hmm. we are welcome to call on you to come and assist? It, it, when available, yes. yes. Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because um, my practice as a counsel, as a senior counsel, uh, it has changed from the beginning where you do unopposed work, where you get unopposed uh, um, matters almost uh, every day. Uh, while if you go, as your practice changes to be a practice of long trials, long opposed motions, uh, you get it in advance so you can uh, see where you are available um, and then avail myself uh, if necessary. Yeah. And uh, you, you've acted in all the areas of the High Court, am I correct? Correct. Except Ex for the Tax Court. Ex except for Tax Court, yes. Right. Correct. And uh, I want to thank you for giving us that opportunity to run to you should we uh, have problems. Um, the minister is here. He knows how many sick leave he's granted yeah. to Gauteng judges. Yeah. And when we desperate, we know where we can go. And it's not only yourself, but I want to thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Uh, I may just add, uh, JP, um, there was one request now about a month ago where a Deputy Judge President Ledwaba contacted me on a short notice. I was not available because of personal circumstances. My wife was in a serious gas explosion and I had to attend to her, so I was not available then. But on the other occasions when I contacted yourself or by Judge Ledwaba, um, you have the freedom to uh, arrange with your attorneys to see where we can fit in. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, DCJ. Thank you, JP. Commissioner Dudu. Uh, thank you, DCJ. Uh, good, good, good morning, sir. Good morning, Commissioner. What I want to, what impressed me about you is that you, you don't, you seem not to give up uh, you, you are determined. It is for the fourth time now since I was part of this commission that you are here. Correct, correct, yes, uh, Commissioner. You, and the reason why uh, I want to serve my country and uh, I feel uh, uh, in terms of the Constitution, um, if I have the opportunity to, to serve my country further in this capacity, I would, pre I would like to do it. Now, can you share with this commission Three times you are unsuccessful and you are here again. What is the difference? What improvements? What are the things that you can put on the table and say, this time around, I'm geared up, I'm ready? Well, Commissioner, the first time around, uh, and I suppose, and I don't have statistics about that, uh, very few white males are appointed first time around. Uh, and it's also the availability of posts. Um, 
if, 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 and if you were at all the interviews, you would recall that uh, the recommendations made by the different parties, starting with the GCB, the uh, Law Society, Nadal, uh, um, Black Lawyers Association, nobody questioned my capabilities. Uh, the reasons, and the last time around for Limpopo, uh, the reason was, and you're not uh, forwarded with reasons, but it was clear because of that, it was only two posts, and it was a, 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 a lady and a, a black fellow colleague who was appointed for the representation. And I accept that. Uh, it, there was nothing wrong with my application as such. But to answer you further, uh, from 2015, if I look back today, uh, I've seen a huge growth in myself, my confidence, um, the quality of my judgment speak of that, that there is a vast improvement. Not that they were bad in the beginning, uh, but with experience you grow. So I've gained a lot of experience. I'm comfortable, and if appointed, um, with my vast experience, um, as and I expect that there will be a question about that with regard to my age, um, experience and wisdom can be fused with younger appointees. Um, I have experienced it uh, the last year or so that even newly appointed judges uh, uh, approach me from time to time just to be a soundboard um, and, and Specifically, Judge Makoba, when he approached me, um, he said, can I, can I uh, tap your wisdom in a specific matter? It's okay, it's okay. Now, 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 lastly, can you convince me that when I sit down, really considering you for the appointment to the bench, what is it that is exceptional that I must, I must look at, considering one, your age, you are 66, and I'm looking at the composition of this division. Out of the 76 judges, 30 of them are, are white, 15 white females and 15 white males. What Good. is it that you think is exceptional about you? Exceptional about me yes. is my vast experience. I also know that uh, one of the white males, and the JP can con confirm that, uh, Judge Fury is retiring at the end of the year. Um, and Judge DeFoss is not far away from retiring. So um, I have, I have uh, lots of skills, particularly if you look at my experience, um, criminal court-wise, and there's always, there's always a need for experienced criminal law presiding officers. So you, you get my experience, uh, and you get, if I can quote the words of uh, um, uh, Judge of, uh, who contacted me last week, the wisdom which comes with experience. Thank you, Deputy CJ. Thank Thanks. you. Commissioner Nyambi. Uh, thanks, DCJ. Uh, morning, Advocate. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, Todo has covered uh, my first part. I'm going to ask just one question. As somebody that has acted for quite some time in Gauteng Division, probably if you can share with us uh, a critical challenge that you think uh, you'll address should you be given an opportunity to be a permanent judge in that division. One of the challenges at this stage is the proceeding from hard copies to electronic copies in court, the case line system, which uh, under the guidance of our JP, uh, in my view, is functioning good, but there are some hiccups. Um, one of the major things um, is to assist which I've done now in the third term with, with an acting judge, and she battled because of lack of experience um, with how to proceed with all the directives which are there. And I could assist her on a daily basis uh, when she comes to, came to my chambers and asked her. So um, if you appoint me, you get a lot of uh, knowledge, but you also get the ability to assist uh, uh, people with lesser experience. In view of my uh, past as a part-time lecturer at the universities, uh, as a lecturer at the Justice College, and the 16 ongoing years I've been involved in the training of pupils at the Pretoria Bar. Um, so I'm always open to assist, and 
every system, every system can be improved, can be improved. Um, so, yeah, that is, to, to, to see that the court in Gauteng runs even more sufficient than it is at the moment. To try and come with, and it's difficult to give you examples uh, uh, without being there at court where a specific problem may arise on a specific day. But there are issues which can be addressed, uh, and with the open relationship I have with the JP and the DJP, um, can discuss it with them how to assist. I'm tempted to ask you the last one. What might be your weakness? Sorry? What is your weakness? My witness. Your weakness. My what we is your sorry, weakness? Sorry. <laughs> the acoustics. My weakness um, is that I tend to, um, uh, maybe it's a weakness, I tend to work too long hours uh, and maybe then from time to time come too late, uh, late at home. Uh, a weakness which I have um, is that and I was accused, and the JP knows uh, she was my master uh, when I started People Each Judge told me. She accused me of still having, uh, and the Afrikaans, start teams mentally tight because I'm in chambers just past seven in the morning. That's a weakness uh, if I compare myself with many of the other colleagues there. It's a weakness to be there too early, and uh, I was fortunate, unfortunately, in one occasion, I left the, the court. Um, as I came out of the court, the JP was also in court uh, on a, a full bench, um, and we walked into one another. Uh, it was after hours, so it's, it's a weakness, if you can describe it. Uh, no, I don't have other weaknesses, uh, supporting the wrong teams or so, off the record, that may be so, but no. I have a passion for children. That you can see as a, as a weakness, that I'm overprotective towards children to young people. Uh, you'll also notice out of my application, my involvement uh, with the Jacaranda Children's Home, where they are in our house, which we administer, 12 uh, young boys, of which at this stage, eight are black boys, uh, which we're trying to rehabilitate and to put back into community so that we can keep them and, and, and make of the useful citizens. So a weakness is, yes, my preference for children. Don't worry, we support the same team. It will come right one day. Thank you, Advocate. Thank you. No, we support the same team. It will come okay. Thank you, Advocate. Thank you, TCJ. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Nyambi. Thank you very much, uh, DCJ. Good, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, as far as... I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is in relation to... I see that you, you have said in some of the, the reviews uh, that came from the magistrate court in relation to the decisions of that court. Um, of late, there have been very a lot of decisions from different divisions of the High Court where the quality of the responses from magistrates and the delays associated with that and lack of compliance with the time frames in Section 103 of the Criminal Procedure Act have been lamented by the judges. Um, how, how can we solve that? Because that goes at the heart of uh, the accused person's rights. Um, in getting their, their issues, their appeal head and all those. How, how can we deal with that? Commissioner, um, <clears throat> and yeah, I'm going to refer back to the first time I met the JP, before I started acting, it was at uh, the quarterly PEC meetings, um, and they, all the role players were together. Um, that is one of the forums where uh, this can be addressed. Um, you, you have a problem, and that is a mindset problem with the greatest respect to many colleagues uh, in the lower courts, because of the independency of magistrates, you can tell them nothing. Um, I've seen that in my own experience uh, when I had uh, Section 304 reviews in chambers, uh, that you get uh, the response either late or uh, improper response, and you have to send it back again and again and again. Yes, it's to the detriment of the accused person. Uh, there must be better, better cooperation and the JP may decide in his wisdom that somebody is specifically appointed um, to, to address this on an ongoing uh, weekly or monthly basis. Um, 
What we had in the previous dispensation, um, when I was in Whitbank and Magistrate, I was also an assistant uh, prison warden. Uh, because of my duties, I had to go to the prison once a month to go and see what was wrong, to interview, have interviews with inmates, and to see how we can uh, assist them in the process. Uh, the, and maybe it is something which can be addressed, is that there is a better or a new communication channel with uh, the various chief magistrates so that you ha have it uh, under your thumb. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my second question to you is, and, and you are coming from, from the bar, which has, very, which has been on the news over, <laughs> over quite some time, but we are not going to get into that. Um, there is an outcry in, in South Africa uh, that we have a lot of female graduates, um, law graduates, who some of them go into the bar. But for some reason, we do not see these female advocates uh, being partnered with more senior colleagues mm -hmm. doing the juicy work, right? Your pension law, your insolvency law, your competition law. We don't see a lot of them doing that kind of work. Of course, you will see white male, then you're going to see white females, then we're going to see selective uh, black uh, male mm -hmm. who are the usual, right? Uh, in your practice, what, what is it that you have done, if at all, uh, to ensure that those females, black females in particular, uh, are, are given the... Because I don't think it's a much an issue of training. I think it's more about opportunities, because training goes with experience and opportunities that you are actually being afforded to. What have you done in your practice uh, to, to try to assist these black females to be able to get another lift for them to progress in their career. Commissioner, you would have seen out of my application is that in my capacity uh, as the chair of the pro bono committee for many years in Pretoria, I robed in uh, specifically black females, quite a number of them with me. Uh, I'm t I take pro, pro bonos uh, and then take them with me to expose them and to expose them to attorneys. I have also a system in place uh, being on the training committee of the Pretoria Society of Advocates is that in March when the different groupings are done um, and a group is allocated to two juniors and one senior counsel to work with them during their practical workshops, I identify there specifically uh, black females with potential to take them and to monitor and to guide them through the year through their training um, and then also to introduce them to some of the attorneys which I uh, feel will help them so that they can get junior work. I have the last one, uh, it is not a, 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 a black person, it's a white person who's totally blind. Uh, and I assisted him through his pupillage. Uh, and I sat with him so that he could prepare his application for uh, his admission. And I had one of my attorneys to do that for him free of charge. Um, and now uh, he's doing some of the unopposed motion work, which I said, give it to him or give it to one or two of these black ladies. I've done that in the past, and I will continue with that. If I'm appointed, I will continue with my uh, mentoring role at the Pretoria Society, and I've also been approached in the last two months by the Tswani Society of Advocates, by my good friend Mosan Paha Essi, uh, as soon as they are accredited to the LPC, is that I'm going to, to assist them with training there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DCJ. Um, Commissioner Pillay. Thank you, DCJ. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Harlan Morton. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Just to follow up to the questions that were asked uh, by Commissioner Maruma Wachai, um, in your in your application, you deal with the Transformation Committee, and I think you specifically deal with this initiative that you reference now, where um, you bring what seems to be extremely junior people on board um, on a fee-sharing arrangement where you um, sacrifice a portion of your fee um, so that they, they, they can be paid um, to work on the matters which you say they otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. Correct which gives you the impression that this is an initiative uh, designed 
more to expose juniors to work um, rather than a typical senior junior situation where you rely on your junior to actually do work. I don't know if, you, if you're getting the distinction I'm drawing. I, I, I follow what you say, is no. Uh, it is twofold, it's to expose them, but also to, to uh, ask them to do some of the initial drafting of, of papers, etc., so that they can uh, get acquainted to that and that they, their self-confidence can grow. Uh, in May of this year, I was in the SCA, uh, it was a, a white junior lady which I took with me, and I asked her beforehand to do the most of the uh, research, and I just went through her after the drafts, uh, the heads were drafted and so on, to, to see and to correct and to explain to her why I'm doing that. So yes, it's not only to uh, help them financially, but that's necessary, but also to give them exposure to develop themselves and to be introduced to attorneys. Now, that would be comparable in, in the ordinary situation to what we in Johannesburg call the third council rule. Yes. Where we would create a, a position for a third council um, to, 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 to meet the kind of objectives you, you're referring to. I'm more interested in your first junior. Now, how many juniors have you worked with where you've had a fully-fledged junior being a, a black woman, or even a black man for that matter? If I, my memory does not fail me, uh, it may be three to four who I'm took in on full uh, um, briefs. The others were out of my own initiative to expose Oh, to, to have these people exposed to this and to be introduced. So, so you're saying that you've, you've only ever worked with, with three black juniors? No, no, In, no, in no. the first, but, but, oh, can on, I just on, on, my, on full brief, on full, on full brief. brief. Yeah, I yeah, just want to finish my question because it's, it's an important distinction. Yeah. And it's a distinction we've tried to draw over and over again uh, because we, we know that it's, it's the go-to position to, to create a, a a role for a junior for exposure purposes. Um, so I'm going to describe that as a third junior role. I'm really looking for information on when I get briefed on a matter, um, I pick my juniors and when I pick them, I pick people who I know I can rely on and who I, I can um, depend on to run with the matter and I give strategic input. That level of junior. Yeah. Um, and you're saying that you've, you've only ever worked with three juniors on three that Three or case. four, if my memory is correct, but those are whom I've identified during their pupillage to work through, to mentor them. I do not leave them at the end. I take them and, where possible, uh, if there is such a brief and with the consent of your instructing attorney, I take them in. So I start with them during pupillage and I, I t take their hands further. Now, may I ask why that number is so low? It strikes me that... Um, three black juniors is an extremely lo low number. Uh, just to give you context, for example, and, and I don't want to compare apples with oranges, but I'm really just giving you context. Um, at the Johannesburg Bar, if you were making an application for silk, we would look at a number under 15, for example, to be low. Um, so can I just get a sense of why that number is so low? Uh, why you haven't worked with more black juniors in, in a working relationship where you rely on that junior to, uh, to the, contribute to the matter? The, the, the simple reason is it depends on the briefs which you receive. Uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg are worlds apart with the kinds of brief. Uh, commercial briefs are far, far more in, in Johannesburg, and you have the opportunity to do it there. Um, many of my briefs where I take these people in are... Uh, um, RAF matters, where I don't need to do it, but I do it because I want to assist and I want to expose them. So it's, it's a different situation with regard to the kind of brief which you receive. So when you say these people, you mean the, the black juniors you refer to? <laughs> which I draw in. Most of them, yes. A and how many white juniors have you worked with? Two. So you've, you've only ever worked with five juniors? No, no, no. Um, I, I've worked with many of them on a pro bono basis, but on a brief matter, uh, it's about five to six on full brief. Then there were uh, four or five which I took in and I shared my fees with them. So in total, uh, it, 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 it should be more than ten, but I haven't, I didn't keep record of it. Uh, 
I'll have to run through my memory for that. And final question, the, the matters where you worked with black juniors, those were RAF matters, is, is that what you, you're saying? Um, most of them, uh, two of them were unlawful arrests, um, where uh, it was black juniors, uh, we're busy with one which we're preparing the, do uh, the documentation, all the pleadings for, for uh, a leave to appeal, um, which I'm, it's, it's a colored uh, junior and a, a black uh, junior uh, who I'm assisting. They asked me if I can assist them. I said, you go on, uh, I will assist you. I'm coming in on pro bono. I'm not going to charge a fee. The full fees will be shared between you two guys. So can I just understand the three ma matters were matters where black juniors brought you in as the leader? Um, about three, four matters. So, so it's, it's where you are brought in by, by a black junior? By junior, where, where I've been approached, but then there were matters where I take them in. So in total, it must be at least 10 with whom I've worked in a senior-junior relationship. Thank you, Chief Justice. Commissioner McGonish. Thank you very much, uh, TCJ. Uh, good afternoon, Advocate Mata. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, mine is a follow-up from what uh, can, uh, Commissioner Nyambi raised. Uh, my observation is that uh, you have identified, you know your witnesses, but I don't see any commitment from yourself to look at those or to change or to improve yourself on those weaknesses. Um, it's important that we must always strive from developing from being hard workers to be smart workers. Judges are very important in the development of our society. Now, from my observation from your response, and I think if my memory serves me well, it's not the first time that your, that question is, was asked to you. Um, is that there is no time that is being made or concerted effort on your side to do strategic reflections. And the issue would be how will you develop society if you don't do strategic reflections? And you seem to be fine with it. Your comment, please. My comment, Commissioner, is that uh, yes, I do planning in, in my preparation. I, I, I strive towards working smarter, but working smarter does not mean uh, you have to work uh, at a, a lower input of taking of, of, of all the, uh, the necessary reading, which is uh, as, as you're supposed to do. Uh, I, I, I work towards it, better managing myself uh, so that I have more time avail available to develop. Uh, at first, when you, you start, um, you read everything. You read everything, every letter. Uh, you start to develop by preparing smarter. Uh, to go past in, 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 in thick briefs, to, uh, to go past the normal uh, notices which are not important but which is just correspondence between the parties. In the, in the, in the beginning, you go through that because you, you, you may be afraid that something is hidden in that. But you develop a system uh, to read what is important um, and then, yeah, you, uh, it is to develop to work smarter. Yes, I, I do that. Thank you, TCJ. Thank you, Advocate Martin. Thank you. Thank you, TCJ. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, it's the afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Um, can I just ask you one question? I, it, it's so, sort of related to um, Advocate Pillay's question, but on the other side of the coin, my, my anxiety is to see that the candidates th that apply, some of them may be white, of course, because this is a multiracial society, but I want to see that they have a commitment to transformative adjudication. And the reason for that is because South Africa is one of the, well, actually the most unequal society in the world. And our constitution says equality is at the heart of the constitutional enterprise. Now, I've been looking in vain to find your approach to adjudication that shows commitment to applying constitutional values. And I sort of thought maybe it's the cases you got, maybe it's the, the place where you were, 
and I just can't find any grasp of your commitment to cons uh, transformative adjudication as a judge so, so that we can say, all right, yes, he's white and he's 65, but he has an impeccable record in transformative adjudication. And quite frankly, there's just nothing on your record. I just want to put that to you so that you can look at it and comment and say I'm wrong. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, uh, the, the one observation which you made, it, it depends on the type of cases which is uh, allocated to you. Not all cases um, has a, a, a premier question to be addressed, uh, that is a constitutional issue. But all cases must be done in terms of the Constitution. So, um, because I only appeared in the Constitutional Court on two occasions, it does not mean I, uphold the con I do not uphold the Constitution. Uh, my commitment to that is, and if you read the nomination letter by Mpaha EC, uh, my role in transformation um, from, from the early 80s, uh, where I started. As a judge, your duty is first to adjudicate what is placed before you. And if there's no specific constitutional question which had to be dealt with, then there's no need. But if there are, then you address them um, in, 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 in the judgments. And there were issues uh, with regard to the, the rights of children, which I've addressed. Um, there was one matter which with the consent of the acting Deputy Judge President Pottrell, where there were six uh, different opposed applications between the two parties, the mom and the dad. Um, I asked her whether it would be fine if I consolidate that so that we can do it and handle it. Um, and yes, you have to, to have to consider the Constitution and all that because it con uh, affects the rights of access of the parents to the children, but primarily the rights of the children. So indirectly, most of my judgments, uh, they will be uh, evidence of the upholding and uh, the commitment to, uh, which I have towards the Constitution. Sorry, if, if you don't mind, if I can just follow this up. Yeah, you're Because welcome. I think your answers creates more problems for me. Uh, look, I, I, I'm not going to uh, criticize you for, you know, uh, you say, well, you've done transformation, you know, I must look at all of these black juniors you've trained, mm. etc. That's fine. That's what Commissioner Pillay was asking you about. What I'm looking at is the mindset. It's the fact that when the cases come, a judge knows that they are bound by Section 39.2 as a starting point to approach in every case. What I, I'm struggling with is this idea that, no, 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 if no, no, if no one raises a constitutional issue, it doesn't arise. In fact, your, your answer says, if no constitutional issue is raised, then I don't have to apply it. No, 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 no. Uh, 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 it's, it's with respect correct, uh, incorrect. Yes, if, if there's no specific constitutional point raised, it does not mean that I have to apply the law in terms of the Constitution. I continue with that, to give them a speedy, a fair trial with everything which the Constitution uh, requires from me. Uh, but if there's not a specific question where the constitutionality of a specific regulation or so is at stake, uh, there's no need to go into that. Yeah, you have to consider the workload uh, which a judge in the Gauteng Division has. So if it's not a specific point, you don't, you're not going to belabor that. But underlying all my judgments can be measured against the Constitution, and you will find that I am following the Constitution as for, for, for in each and every instance. All right, thank you. Any questions from the, oh, yes. Just to follow up, uh, is it possible for you to give us an example of a judgment in which you do that? A, a, a judgment, uh, the, uh, one matter um, was in the specific, the toy matter where um, the mother brought an urgent application, that is the third application. What she called um, is to set aside the judgment by my brother Momela with regard to, uh, it was uh, the passport uh, which was authorized for the father and his parents to take the child on a, uh, a cruise to the uh, Portuguese islands. Um, in that, you have to look at what are the rights of parents 
children leaving the country, isn't there anything of uh, personal, uh, um, minor children being trafficked, et cetera, et cetera? So you have to go and look and you have to go to balance all the rights which is enshrined in the Constitution, whether it's the parents' rights, whether it's the juveniles' rights. You have to look at that. You have to, there's another matter which uh, it was four applicants, which was a consolidated application, report, uh, it's in my bundle as Rendsburg and others, where they entered into contract with the uh, um, vocational training contracts with the uh, principals, but they did not disclose that prior to in, entering into that, they were involved in other schemes uh, in which they uh, uh, earned a living. Now, if you look at the regulations of the LPC, uh, they have to disclose that to the LPC before they enter into that. Now, it is a question of this person's right to earn a living, and you have to compare it with the compulsory uh, provisions of the LPC, where he has to obtain that permission before he enters into that. Um, the ultimate is that when it was disclosed, the LPC asked uh, for guidelines on that. And I gave a guideline and said, because it's disclosed at this late stage, it's not for the principal nor the LPC to condone it, but it's for the court to have a look at it, whether the training which they underwent was not jeopardized by these uh, other activities. The one instance, the guy was assisting his mother as a bookkeeper in her real estate business, etc. So you have to balance the right on the one side of the, the public right in the administrative law in the LPC, also with the right to earn a, 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 a reasonable living, a constitutional right. But there are limitations on it, and that's one of the limitations which they should have adhered to before they entered into the agreement. So there are many as, in, aspects which we can go through, each and every judgment, if you want to. Thank you. No, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Chair, I, I do need to follow up on this, because these two judgments that have been given really do create problems. The, on the first judgment, you say that you applied the rights of parents. After of, considering the, the rights of the child. Yes, but I'm talking about the rights of the parents that you mentioned. Are they in the Constitution? Every child is, 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 uh, has a right to be properly taken care of, firstly by his natural uh, peers, or then by the, uh, all the others which you find there. That the child has the right to... to, to, to uh, uh, proper taking care of board, lodging, etc., etc. So there's the converse thereof that the parents also have certain rights and obligations towards their minor children. Then on the second one, you say the rights you were engaged with were the rights to earn a living. Yes. I... Thank you. The, the right to which I refer there to is the right of every person to follow the occupation which he wants to follow, subject to the limitations in the Constitution. Any questions from the virtual platform? Yes, Deputy Chief Justice. No, thank you. All right. We'll, you, you have first go. Uh, Good thing. Yes. Go ahead. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, Good afternoon, advocate. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, I've been in the other interviews as a panelist when, when you appeared before us. And I just want to refer to one response that you gave us in the last interview when I put it to you that there was a possible collusion uh, between advocates and attorney, uh, between attorneys uh, dealing with the RAF. And uh, you explained that you had not encountered collusive conduct, but you have certainly come across widespread abuse of contingency fee agreements, which you said was at a startling 95% of the time. And you asked that uh, call for this abuse to be stamped out, which I think all of us fully agree with. But then Commissioner Fourie didn't quite agree with your answer, uh, and we didn't have an opportunity to question you thereafter. Have you given thought to this answer that you've given us? And what do you think that members of the judiciary could do with any attorney or witness, any, uh, when you witness attorney abuse in RAF matters? 
Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I, I recall that, and you also said that uh, it would be f fine if we can talk, me and yourself, afterwards. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity. Um, what I meant when Commissioner Furee uh, questioned me is that uh, a contingency fee agreement, in my view, is there to ensure that the neediest of people have access to court. But what happens, not at much at this stage, but what happened um, a couple of years ago is that 95% of RAF matters were done on contingency fee agreements. But the moment there is a merit order, in my view, there's no longer justification for a contingency fee agreement because, and that is why myself and, and Commissioner Faree differed from one another. I'm not denying anybody access because they're already in court. They have an order. So, and I've taken this up with Judge Jody Collipin while he was still uh, in Pretoria and he's on the Rules Commission. And he said it's an interesting point and I'll have a look at that, is that after merits order has been granted, why is there still a need to have a contingency fee agreement where they charge double fee or 25%, whether they can just continue the normal because they are in court and they have a merits order which they will give the, get their normal fee. So if, if that can be taken to into account, it can save, in my view, I may be wrong, but it can save the RAF vast amounts of money because they're no longer going to pay 100% or double that or 25% uh, of the uh, award which has been made. And I know of one or two instances where the award is made, um, they take the 25% attorneys and they also t t take the full tax account. I had one matter where a person via another attorney approached me and we went to court. Uh, well, it didn't end up in court because the attorney settled it as soon as the application was served on him because we then served an application on him for repayment of an award of 4.8 million. The third party received about 1.8. The rest was allegedly costs. We know that there was a 207,000 uh, uh, rand account which was taxed. And we just, because the uh, third party and his father came by another turning to us, and we just issued summons against, uh, uh, application against that person, and we cited the Road Accident Fund and the Law Society then as second and third respondents, not to take any order against them, but that they just take notice of this practice. And within a week, um, there was a repayment of in excess of 900,000 rand by the attorney uh, to the client, to our client, uh, of the, who should have originally received that. So yes, th that should, can be done. But coming back to that, uh, my difference with Mr. Furi and I stand with it, after a merits order, there's no justification to continue on a contingency fee agreement because you're no longer at risk. I hope that answers your question. Just as a follow-up, I know that as judicial officers, you have to deal with the attorneys or advocates that represent clients in RAF matters. But I think just last week I read of a, of a ruling where the client who came from a rural area was not even aware that a matter had been settled and the legal counsel pocketed the money. Now, now, how can it be made easier for South Africans who have to go to attorneys to submit this claim for them to know that a claim has been settled and that they have a right to that settlement and not wait for their own attorneys or legal representatives to let them know? Thank you. Commissioner, that uh, may be an administrative elephant in, 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 in the, the whole RAF field. Um, it may be that it, it can be considered is that when there's a person from a rural area and many of them are illiterate and they don't know, they know, don't know the difference between say 100,000 or 200,000 Rand. Um, I don't think the RAF has the capacity to police all this. If we lived, if we lived in um, a 100% correct society, we could have policed that. 
uh, but it's very difficult to police it. Uh, maybe there must be some sort of investigation is that before amounts are paid over into trust accounts of attorneys, that there's some sort of uh, rectification or document uh, authorization signed by the client, which was properly explained to him or her uh, what was the amount which was awarded and when it was and so on. But yes, I hear what you say, and it's a difficult thing to root out that those clients are in many instances not informed and then they get a settlement amount. And we are all here, literate people, but those illiterate people there from uh, the far off areas, um, from Mala Molele or anywhere else, 100,000 is a lot of money for them. Do they know the difference between 100 and 200,000? I doubt it. But th this is the system and we must find some, some sort of solution in that. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Commissioner Bredenbach. I have no questions. Thank you, um, Deputy Chief Justice. Oh, what was it? Commissioner Bernard? Thank you, <laughs> DCJ. Um, and with Colin Muter, could I ask you, you, you mentioned you, you worked with uh, someone. What are the specific challenges in our court system and in the, in, in the work that uh, we have to do as legal practitioners that are faced with uh, persons that are visually impaired? Um, electronically, if we lived uh, in a world, a first uh, world country, we may have the electronic assistance to assist these people. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, referring to this uh, visually impaired uh, counsel which I assisted, there's another lady which also did a pupillage and um, I had an arrangement with another counsel to monitor her. Um, they, and this is just a perception, not out of the law, but out of the community in general. They worked one evening during their pupillage after five, and they found an Uber to take them home. And when the Uber arrived, of course, none of them, uh, neither Brenda nor Renette could see them, but the Uber guys saw that they had their guide dogs with them, and he turned around and he just sped off. This is the perception we have with these people. Uh, so, when these two uh, passed their pupillage, I went to the specific chambers, to Groenkloof chambers and to club chambers, and I negotiated with the management of each of these chambers as to take in these two uh, now newly uh, admissioned uh, advocates to assist them, but for a specific period, and I don't know exactly what the period was, what was reached, that you give them a small office free of charge so that they can settle themselves, which is also accessible for their guide dogs. And about two months ago, I was there at Groenkloof and I paid Brendan a visit, and his guide dog, Rex, was with him in his chambers. Uh, so we have to sensitize. We have to sensitize the people that we are working with visually impaired people. Um, they cannot hear, uh, or they can hear, but they cannot see what is going on around them. Um, it is like sensitizing people to, to change of heart with transformation, etc. There will always be resistance against that. Um, not only visually impaired, but people, for instance, who are paraplegics, who are uh, in a wheelchair. What do we do about them? Is all our courts accessible to them? No. But one of the things I, I learned very, very, very early with a person, um, a friend of mine, his son was in a, a rugby incident. He broke his uh, vertebrate and he's now confined to a wheelchair. You don't talk down to the person in a wheelchair. You go and sit next to him so that you're on the same level. It's just small things to sensitize. And that we have to do in courts as well with the court personnel to make it accessible, the, the courts. Um, we have a colleague, if I, 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 I be so bold to refer to Judge Mzalele as, as my colleague, She's my sister, my, my friend, she's in a wheelchair. Fortunately, there's a ramp for her and she uses a specific court. But when she has to uh, be assisted in a full court or so, then there's special arrangements to be made so that either to the court which she normally takes or to take the ramp, it's a mobile ramp to assist her. So there are many things which we have to do in this country to assist visually impaired but also other impaired persons. But it's <coughs> going to cost a lot of money. 
Um, and maybe um, if the state capture all these cases of a through and we get some of those monies back, it can be utilized so that we develop this person. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Thank you, DCJ. Thank you, Commissioner Bernard. Commissioner Balloy. Thank you, DCJ. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here. Good, good afternoon, afternoon yes. Commissioner. Um, I'm looking at page 33 of your of the questionnaire where you've listed the the times that you have acted, and you started 2015, and it's quite an impressive. Uh, list of 83, a total of 83 weeks of acting. Now, often uh, councils struggle with making themselves available to act because of work that is on their desks and the difficulty mm. of, of juggling that and coming back to it. Now, now I look at your 83 weeks uh, and your, the fact that in 24 years of your practice, you have worked, I think you've said about 10 uh, juniors, a total of 10 juniors on full paid briefs, if, if, if I understood you correctly. Uh, but certainly the number of juniors that you've used less than 15, it seems, on full paid brief. And I take into account, taking into account rather, the kind of work where you say predominantly your practice is road accident fund, and I see medical negligence as well. Now, the road accident fund work we know has pretty much dried up uh, for practitioners. Um, and, and so uh, what I'm trying and what I can't see from your application is then what is your practice, in fact? And, and, and the question for me is significant to get a sense of your exposure and litigating. And keep in mind when you answer that uh, most of the road accident fund matters anyway, most of the time they get settled by far the majority. Um, and even medical negligence, often the merits get settled and there will be conversations about quantum. We know by far the majority gets settled. With all of that, um, uh, what, what is in fact your practice and your exposure that we should take into account in considering your suitability or your, your readiness to sit as a, as a full-time judge? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, coming back to the question, and if I understood you correctly, uh, incorrectly, please correct me, is that uh, although uh, I have 24 years' experience, it's very seldom that uh, before the first 10 or 12 years have passed that you are in a position um, to take in juniors or are you requested by your attorneys to take in a junior. So it's, 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 a, it's a smaller window in my experience. And then my acting as well, um, I try to focus my practice um, to such an extent as when I was, um, approach or avail myself to act so that I can, with the consent of attorneys, move some of my matters to other times if possible, um, or to uh, only act when, because of a trial practice, you're not in court every day, you know in advance, uh, most of the times, three to four months, that, that uh, you, there's a notice of set down for trial, so you can space yourself in between. Um, no, my practice was not only or predominantly road accident fund. I did a lot of criminal work. Uh, I do other contractual work, insolvency, etc. cetera. Um, with the downscaling of um, road accident fund work, um, I still do a lot of um, administrative law. I do a lot of uh, uh, unlawful arrests. Um, I've been on the other side where I've been uh, taken in uh, twice on two occasions by the state attorney so that I can assist them. I have done um, road accident fund on behalf of the road accident fund to work there because the attorneys approach me because they see you on the one side and they, they will also want to engage you on the other side. So uh, if, if taken into account the times which I acted, um, then um, excluding your first 10 to 12 years of practice, where you very seldom take in a junior. Um, there were times which I could fit in juniors, uh, depending on the kind of work, and I've given you an indication of the juniors which I've taken in. Thank you, 
thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Advocate Holen Muta. We have exhausted the questions we had for you. You are excused. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Justice. Thank you to all the commissioners. And may I wish you well with the rest of the week and next week. You too. Thank you so much. Okay.